You're good to go. Okay, thanks, Yusuf. And um, it's really nice to be back uh, to uh, the Ask Dr. B show. I, I want to wish everybody a happy new year and uh, welcome back. Um, this week, we're missing Coach E, uh, but we're really excited uh, and wishing Eric and his family all the best as they uh, await the uh, arrival of their new baby. Um, we haven't heard anything yet, but we're, we're all very excited uh, for Eric and his family. Um, I hope that everybody's had a wonderful holiday, uh, despite what's going on in our universe right now with COVID. Uh, it's, it's really been a, a challenging year, uh, to say the least. And, you know, regardless of COVID, um, I always take this time uh, at New Year's and Christmas to reflect on my personal life and my, my goals, my, both um, personally and professionally. And um, my dream has always been as an orthopedic surgeon uh, to, to keep people moving and doing the activities that they love to do. And I've got to say that I'm just so grateful for the fact that I've had the opportunity to um, meet Eric and uh, our team and start working with them. Because uh, it was funny, the first time I met Eric, uh, you're we saying, well, what is it you want to do? And he's like, well, I want to keep people moving and doing the things they love to do. And I kind of laughed and I said, well, wait, that's my dream. How can it be your dream? But so we both have the same dream. And that's really what this show is all about. It's, it's to teach you about musculoskeletal injuries uh, and what steps you can take to either treat them or to avoid them so that you can remain active uh, throughout your whole life. And uh, I want to encourage you to uh, reach out to us, to ask questions, give us feedback about your injuries, both good and bad, because if things aren't going well, we can all learn together about what we can possibly do to change that around. And we always love to hear inspirational stories when people have gotten better and are back to their activities and, and, um, and feeling better. So um, I want to encourage uh, everyone today uh, to join into the conversation. Um, we're so fortunate. We have uh, Lisa Bentley joining us, uh, Coach Lisa instead of Coach E. Uh, and Lisa is just an amazing example of somebody who loves to be active. She has competed in 33 Ironman events and has won 11 of them. And th this is a, a truly remarkable feat. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Ironman uh, triathlon events, um, they consist of a 2.4 mile swim, followed by a 112 mile bike ride. And then you start the 26.2 mile marathon. So talk about movement longevity. Lisa has this covered. Um, uh, and over her career through uh, training and um, um uh, Lisa has a general, um, a genetic condition called cystic fibrosis. She's had to deal with multiple health issues. Um, and we're so fortunate to have her here today to uh, share some of her stories and give us some tips for recovery and return to sport. Um, so Lisa, um, welcome and um, happy new year. Uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you here. Uh, is she here yet, Use? Uh, not yet. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I thought she was here. But um, yeah. if you, Lisa has a book. Um, it's called The Unlikely um, Champion. And this is a fantastic book. We've got a, um, we've got a link to her book in the um, description of the, um, uh, in, uh, for the program below. And um, she goes through uh, some of the um, wins and losses that she's had um, throughout her career. And uh, what I loved most about the book is it wasn't really about winning, but it was about um, learning skills and tools to have fulfillment within your life, to win in life and um, achieve happiness. So um, I think she is here now. Yep. Um, she's just connecting and um, hi, Lisa. 
Hi, Aaron. How are you? Hi, Eric. Um, hi. Uh, Eric is actually, he's not with us today. We have oh. Yusuf here. Eric is, um, his wife is pregnant and she's due any minute now. <sighs> so um, we are having Coach Lisa instead of Coach E um, to uh, here today to join us um, for some inspiration. Hello. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was just telling everybody um, about how amazing you are and um, all the sort of, um, um, well, that you love to be active and that uh, you have uh, are an Ironman champion. And I've really had to deal with a number of um, injuries and setbacks uh, in your lifetime and during your career. And um, I was hoping that today you could share some of your stories with us and some of your inspiration, uh, because I've, I've gotten some emails over the holidays with people that are, I think, really struggling during the pandemic. You know, they're frustrated, um, they're in pain, um, their sport is on hold, uh, they're having difficulty getting motivated. Um, and, and so um, I thought maybe we could start out by talking about your recent injury when uh, in September, when you fell off your bike, and then <laughs> use this as maybe an example of what steps you take when you're injured. And, and then we can delve into some more details of uh, specifics of dealing with not feeling so great about being injured. Yeah, sounds good. And, and thank you. It's, uh, I've definitely had lots of injuries, but it's interesting because I had a great team and you were part of that team that I didn't probably get as injured as I could have. I, I mean, I raced in Ironman for 20 years and raced a lot. And with a body that probably wasn't meant to do Ironman, you know, dead flat feet, uh, cystic fibrosis, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I had a lot of things stacked against me, which I didn't really think about at the time or appreciate. It was just, okay, let's do this. Uh, so I had lots of niggles. And I think that's like the key thing is, as everyone moves forward and as we have a new year, is that awareness of if you have a little ache or a pain, if you can nab it in the first 28, 24 to 48 hours, it could be a two day injury versus a two month injury. And I think that is something that I've learned over time. And I've learned that because of the people that are around me that give me good advice that care about me personally, as opposed to me winning races. They care about me walking when I'm 60, 70 or 80. So I think that's one takeaway for everybody that's listening is, is really just don't ignore those little signs that you have that maybe if I just take one day off my beloved sport, that I might not have to take a month off of it. So that's the first thing that I would, I would just preface this with. Uh, I've had a ton of injuries. Actually, my, my latest injury, the radial head fracture, which is your elbow. I uh, was riding my bike, something I've done for at least 30 years. And I was going into my small chain ring on my bike as I was going up a hill. Something I don't do that often. Usually I'm more of a grunter. I just love to like hammer up the hill. And I thought, oh, you know what? I don't, I'm by myself. I can go into my small chain ring and cruise up this hill. And when I moved into my small chain ring, my gears jammed my bike just literally stopped in its place as I'm vertical going up a hill and there's nothing there was nothing I could do and I just fell over on my on my arm but I you know I shook it off and people stopped you know I could you know there's so many things that could have gone wrong and this is sort of what I do when I'm assessing <laughs> injury <laughs> is I'm like oh this wasn't so bad you fell into traffic you could have got run over uh, so that's number one. So I'm alive. Fantastic. And then I, you know, as you start to gang up on yourself, like, how could this have happened? Oh my goodness. Why did this happen? I thought, well, had I, you know, you're, when you're on a bike, the bike I was on, I have clipless pedals, which means my cycling shoes actually clip right into my bike, sort of like ski bindings. And I was thinking if I had have actually tried to unclip and put my foot down, I probably would have broken my ankle. So that was the other side where, and I was thinking, okay, this could be way worse. <laughs> you could have been run over by car or you could have actually tried to save yourself. And in doing so probably fractured your ankle 
and ankles are never good thing to fracture. So I thought, okay, I think this is a good thing, but I didn't actually think that it was broken. <clears throat> 17 years prior, <clears throat> excuse me, I had broken my radial head, same arm. And uh, so, I, and I know that part of the radial head, so it's breaking the bone here, is that you can't do the wrist motion. So as soon as I fell, I was like doing this, <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And so I got back on my bike and I kept riding. And cause that would mean, of course I wasn't injured <laughs> if I kept riding. <laughs> and, um, and so I kept riding and I kept twisting and I'm like, no, I'm sure it's okay. Anyways, I, I got home and I iced my arm, my elbow. I didn't actually know what to ice to be honest. Cause it was just so, such a trauma. And, um, took pictures of it. And, and of course, COVID's happening. And I didn't really want to go to the hospital. And my family was all, you better go to the emergency. And I'm like, well, you know, this isn't life or death. I think I'm just going to give it a couple of days and see if it's better, and then get a requisition and actually go get an x ray. So <clears throat> that's what I ended up doing. And sure enough, it was a fractured radial head. So you know, the things that go through my head with injury is okay, I know, I mean, actually, again, I try to tell myself the good things about breaking my arm. And so again, the good things were wasn't run over by a car. This doesn't require surgery. It wasn't my ankle, which is a whole other terrible ball game for me and my flat feet. And also just looking at the fact that a bone heals, to be quite honest, <laughs> tendon and ligament is like such a different uh, problem. I mean, I've had an Achilles, I, you know, previously when I was a professional athlete, I had Achilles injury that lasted years <laughs> and a bone heals in six weeks, you know, sometimes less. So bones heal. So I kept telling myself, okay, bones heal. I need, you know, a good solid three weeks to lay down the foundation. And then, you know, gradually I can add some things in. So I focus then on what I can do. So the wonderful thing about a radial head fracture is that it doesn't have to be casted really you're just um, using your common sense a bit. And of course I used uh, Dr. Aaron's common sense by asking her <laughs> what I could and couldn't do. So I can't take all the credit. Uh, and um, you know, I knew I could still run. I could still ride my bike. Uh, granted riding outside was gonna be compromised uh, because it wasn't so much that I couldn't hold myself up on my bike but my reactions wouldn't be as good. So that would be compromised. So I stayed indoors riding my bike. I ran, <clears throat> I actually kept swimming, but knowing that I wouldn't have strength. So I was really just swimming and going through the range of motion, uh, more just for mental stuff, but not asking myself to push. I couldn't get out of the water. I couldn't physically lift myself up. So for me, that's what I did. I, I was sad that I couldn't do weights anymore. I was sad that I couldn't do the rowing machine, but again, I focused on what I could do. And I think that that's always the important thing when you have an injury is to control what you can control. And sometimes it's an opportunity to learn other, other skills and other um, sports. Well, that's, that's great, Lisa. And I got to say that I cracked up. So Lisa emailed me part way through. She, she, you know, she has a part of her team. There's another physician that is involved, uh, Dr. Gallia, and he's fantastic. I really enjoy Tony and, She's like, oh, but Aaron, I, I need a little bit more de definition here because like uh, Tony's basically told me you can do everything but handstands and, you know, knowing Lisa, she's going to go and do everything but a handstand. <laughs> and um, honestly, like I loved her email because as she's already pointed out, she's very positive. Like it was like, okay, I'm alive. I didn't get run over by a car. Uh, it wasn't my ankle because I can still walk the dogs. Uh, so she's focusing on what she can do. And what she needed from me then was a little bit more specifics about what could she do safely. And um, just for those of you out there, um, all fractures, you can't necessarily go and do everything. So I'm just going to share my screen for one second, because I want to show you what Lisa's uh, radial head fracture potentially looked like. I, this is not her x-ray, but it's... Um, uh, close, close, I would imagine what this is what it looked like. If you look at the x-ray on the left, we're looking at the side of the elbow. This is the distal humerus. So that's your arm, the upper arm bone. 
then the olecranon or the funny bone. So that would be right here would be the tip of your elbow. And then the radial head is on the thumb side of your forearm and it articulates with the uh, humerus at the elbow. And you can see where the yellow arrow, there's a crack in the radial head. So this line here would be the normal cortex and you can see this crack right across the radial head and that there's no displacement of the fracture. So that's good. And I think that's what Lisa likely suffered from. And you'd mentioned in your original email to me that you'd had a previous radial head fracture and it was a little different, wasn't it? Where you had a lot of pain trying to rotate your forearm <clears throat> or put your thumb up, palm up, which is the classical thing. It's this rotational movement of putting your palm down and palm up, which affects the radial head. And if somebody has displacement of the radial head fracture, they may actually not be able to rotate their, their palm up. So if you do have a fracture that is more serious as far as displaced or unstable, then you should go to the hospital, even if it is COVID. Um, but Lisa, <laughs> Lisa did do the right thing. And, and on the x-ray on the right is a, a, a sort of the opposite extreme of a radial head fracture. You can see here where there are fragments of bone and it's, I call this bone dust where the radial head is basically exploded and it's, it's out of position. And this person would have a very painful elbow. They wouldn't be able to keep riding their bike. They wouldn't be able to move their arm around and, and they would have to go to the hospital. So, you know, we're putting things into perspective here for Lisa's injury. So when you have um, a stable injury, um, and I'm just, this is my last slide, I promise. <laughs> um, when you have a stable injury, really the goal here is to decrease the swelling and to improve your range of motion. And for me, the key, and what I told Lisa when she reached out to me was to start to activate the muscles around her forearm, hand, and upper arm, because this helps to decrease the swelling. And it's a very interesting phenomenon that I've observed over the years uh, for post-op patients or patients with acute fractures that are stable that if you can get the swelling down and get the muscles turned on in the area of injury, your pain goes away very quickly. So I came up with this term over the holidays, actually AA, figuring, you know, thinking about everybody's <laughs> kind of suffering here. We all want to go to AA. We have to, <laughs> we can't deal with the pain, but really AA stands for align and activate. So for with Lisa, what we would have her do is put her elbow into a position that would be comfortable, which would probably have been her forearm either in neutral, so her thumb would have been like this, or a palm down, and then to push and hold to isometrically turn on the muscles uh, around her elbow, which will pump any inflammation, pump swelling out of the area, and prevent fibrosis so that the range of motion comes back much more uh, readily. And then once you have um, decrease the swelling and turned on the muscles, then you can start resetting the neuromuscular system, pushing range of motion, and then going up the performance pyramid. So how did, how, Lisa is an exception because she's, she's so um, motivated to, and experienced also, like you've, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're a professional athlete for 20 years, you know, your body inside out and backwards and you know what you can do and what you can't do. And you listen to your body very well. Like, mm -hmm. um, so it's easy for me to give you parameters and say, okay, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if there's a feeling in your body, like I'm sure if you tried to load your arm to push up out of the pool, which you said you didn't do, no. you wouldn't have been able to do it. No, no. And that's what I listened to. And you, you, it was interesting because I was telling you what was hurt. It was interesting because the elbow never hurt. Yes, it was swollen, but mm -hmm. it was my, my wrist, of course, because yes. of rotation. And so you gave me, um, directed me to um, Koji's um, exercises for the wrist and the elbow, the flexed, mm -hmm. flex fist and the isometrics. And as soon as I did those, like, this is the amazing thing about doing the right thing <laughs> is it helped right away yeah. within 24 hours. And this is like be between one and three weeks of a, of a break, which are, you know, that's the painful time. Mm -hmm. You had me doing those flex fists and um, isometrics. And within 24 hours, I noticed a marketable improvement. 
And it was amazing. And it's interesting because now I'm four months later, Mm -hmm. but about a month ago, I was still experiencing a bit of discomfort and I wasn't worried about it because I wasn't doing the right things. I said to myself, (laughs) it's sore because you have abandoned. It's my fault. Like I take ownership for what I'm doing. Um, You know, I was back doing everything. I'm back swimming. I'm back rowing. I'm doing weights but something's not quite right. And I went back to those exercises um, that Eric has, and I'm not lying, within 24 hours, it was 100%. And it was just like you said, uh, you know, AA, align and activate. And, um, and they're so, it's so easy to do. And that's, you know, the, you know, the other thing, which I'm, probably learning more now, even though I'm removed from professional sport, is spending five to 10 minutes a day on your one, your particular area of weakness Mm -hmm. is going to make extraordinary differences. So basically for four weeks, I was like, God, my wrist is still sore. Oh, my wrist is still sore. This elbow mustn't be healed. And then I was like, Lisa, your elbow is healed. The problem is you haven't done anything to get over the speed bump of discomfort. And within 24 hours of doing those exercises, you know, it was, it was bang on. So it's um, yeah, it's interesting. (laughs) Well, it it is interesting. And for me as a physician um, and I see people, like I hear this story over and over and over, and I see people who I can tell, like I'll watch people, I watch sports and Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll see somebody and I'll go, Oh my gosh, that's a shoulder injury waiting to happen. Or this is injuries waiting to happen because I can tell by how their body moves. And yet it's a, it's a personal, it's a human trait that mm-hmm. we don't tend to deal with things until we either can't do something or we're in pain. And I, I've been, Eric and I have been talking a lot about, um, you know, how do we instill a habit for movement that is just like the habit of brushing your teeth. And, and I, I think we, we have to actually start teaching our children and st- teaching youngsters. So it becomes a habit. Like, um, I was talking with someone the other day uh, and he goes, well, my dentist told me that if I don't floss it, or he goes, floss the teeth that you want to have when you're, when you're <laughs> 70. <laughs> and so I kind of have the same feeling. It's like, move the joint. You still want to be able to move when you're 80. And do we need to start freaking people out and say, okay, if you want to be able to touch your toes and put your shoes and socks on, and do you want to be able to walk up the stairs and do you want to prevent having a hip replacement? then you should do these exercises. And yet it's not the sexy fun thing to do. It's not the racing Mm -hmm. around the the block. It's not the, it's not playing your sport. And um, so I I don't know, but it's, it's, you're really good with habits. Like I read your book and one, one thing I, I I love your book um, by the way, I've, I've, (laughs) I've showed everybody earlier. Um, (laughs) So they're, they're hopefully uh, going to pick it up and get some inspiration from you. But one thing that you talk about, which I think is helps with habits is journaling. And could you just tell us a little bit about how you use journaling for performance or for injury and, and how that has helped? Absolutely. You know, what's interesting is now we, we live in this age of explosion of knowledge. I mean, this, this uh, YouTube video is an example of that. Like we, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we needed videos like this. Now there's so much information out there. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it almost, um, it's amazing, but it, it validates what we've been doing for years. So I journaled for the last 30 years. I have 30 years of training logs. And yet now when you listen to a podcast, they talk about journaling and journaling and journaling and, I, and so many things that some of us maybe have been doing for years is now been validated. And for me, it was just what I did because it gave me a tool that I could reference back to. So when I started professional sport or started sport in a, in a bit more serious capacity it would be 1989. And I started to write down my workout and how I felt and what it was like. And, you know, then I started writing down what I wore because, oh, I can't remember. What do I wear running when it's eight degrees Celsius? What do I wear when it's minus eight degrees Celsius? (laughs) And then I started writing down things that I was doing during the day. Uh, So it's interesting. My husband will say, oh, how did we drive to 
Florida last year. And I'll be like, oh, uh, what day did we leave? And I'll look in my journal because it'll say, you know, November the 8th, we drove and we drove I-75, we stopped in Richmond and we, you know, and I've got the whole thing in my journal. So it provides me with a way to look back. And when I was actually, when I was writing my book, I took 20 years of journals and I went through it page by page, not because I was looking for anything in particular, but because I really needed to have a good recollection of what went on. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me to have, have something to tell because I forgot those little innuendos. And I remember there's one thing I included in the book because I'd totally forgotten was this one day where I ran uh, 30 kilometers in the morning and I wrote down, I ran 30 kilometers, was so tired. I didn't feel well. I laid down, I napped for an hour. And then I went and rode my bike 150 kilometers in the afternoon. I was exhausted and grumpy. Like I wrote all this down and I reread that and I was like, holy cow, I didn't realize I trained that hard. And I didn't realize that I often did it when I was tired and didn't feel like it. And then, uh, you know, basically on that day, I'm ready to retire. Like I'm done. Like I feel defeated. Yes, I got the job done, but I'm exhausted. Four days later, I did a workout. I found it in my journal, but I rode my bike three hours, very hard, got off my bike, ran 90 minutes, very hard, like nailed it. And I wrote, adaption is an incredible thing. So on the Monday, I'm basically blubbering through a seven hour workout. And on Thursday, I'm peaking for an incredible four and a half hour workout. And it showed my, me the power of adaptation. But what it showed me even more was that, you know, we're not limited. So that, that was the lesson for me by going backwards, by seeing that. So what I started doing when I was racing was I would go back in my journal and I look for days that were really difficult so that when I got into a race situation I, and it got difficult, I'd say, hey, yeah, but remember this workout? So I would start to recall moments where I overcame adversity, where I found success, where I turned things around. I could find instances where my warm up was terrible, but my workout was brilliant. I found episodes where my work, my warm up was fantastic and my workout wasn't so good. So it just showed me that, you know, don't get so hung up on things. But I had proof by via my journal of enough moments where I had succeeded so that no matter how dire situations got when I was racing, I had something to draw on that would make me feel like I can get through this. I can do this. I can do this. So that's what journaling, you know, so much of it did for me. I also would write down, you know, right foot is sore. You know, this is sore. That is sore. And so I could go back and in the, you know, in the theme of injury prevention, I could sort of see where things started. And so, you know, you might have a foot injury, but it might've started actually in your knee or your hip. So I could kind of look at what instigated it. Or was there a particular workout? I mean, there were tons of workouts where I'd be like, I nailed it. And I would have had an amazing workout and, and writing down, I'm in the shape of my life. This is my year. The next day I'm sick as a dog in bed. So it's like, oh, hmm. that, you know, that workout was what pushed me over the edge. You know, maybe if I had let off about 2%, I wouldn't be sick and I would be, you know, ahead of the game instead of behind. Uh, same with injury. And it's interesting because, you know, now 10 years removed from professional sport, my body is some, somewhat reacting <laughs> to 20 years of racing. And uh, last year I had a torn or I got diagnosed with a torn uh, tibial, uh, post-tibial um, tendon. In you know, I love this. I, I wish I could show you, Aaron, but I look at my training log, which I'm not training per se anymore. I'm exercising, I'm recreating, but I still write down what I'm doing because I think it's fun to look back. And I look back and I see, you know, big toe sore, little toes sore, um, you know, medial ankle sore, this is sore. And I, I kind of look back at June until August when it was diagnosed. And basically the pain was just rolling all over my lower limb because it was manifesting in different places. And, and it shows you how incredible the human body is at trying desperately to accommodate 
a part of the body that's breaking down. And that tendon didn't tear overnight. That tendon tore over time. I'm sure there was something that broke the camel's back. <laughs> Um, in fact, I remember it. I was doing I was doing a speech in Texas, and so I, you know I've had three months of on again, off again pain. Now again, as I said, you're better to take a day off than push through it. But I have a history of terrible feet. I honestly don't know that I have been completely pain free in my feet um, for years. So I just manage my feet. That's been my tactic that I manage it, I run every other day. And usually by the time I get running, I'm, I'm fine. So yeah, there's niggles and aches and pains, but I manage it, I don't run too far, I don't do any of these things. Well, anyways, so for on and off again for three months, I'm chasing this pain all around my foot. In fact, the tendon is never sore, just as an FYI. It was everything around the tendon. I was developing a hammer toe, um, anyway, it was all over. And I'm doing this speech in Texas and I get to the hotel. I'm only there 24 hours. I get to the hotel and I go to the gym and this was just like, this was like candy. It was uh, the best gym I'd ever been to in my life. And I'm <laughs> so excited because it's got treadmills and ellipticals and rowing machines and things. it's got all these things. And I've got the whole morning planned out before my speech and I'm gonna like tear, tear it up on the treadmill. I don't have a treadmill. So I was so excited. I'm going to run on the treadmill. I'm going to do this. And then I had a 25 meter pool and I had all this in my bucket list to do. And I get up to get on the treadmill and I'm like, oh, my foot kind of hurts. And I'm like, I don't care. And I just kept jamming up the speed and jamming it up. And anyways, I think that was the straw that um, broke the camel's back. But my point about journaling is that when I look back now on my journal, I look and I go, wow, you know, there was, there was a lot going on and it was just a matter of time. And, um, you know, anyway, I've managed that. And, you know, at the end of the day, I even look at that torn tendon. And while I'm not grateful for it, I'm grateful for the career I had in spite of my flat feet. And I'm grateful, you know, I shouldn't have been able to do what I did. You know, I, ultimately, I think I ran maybe 40 marathons over the course of 10 or so years. And I've, you know, flat feet genetics. And so I'm grateful for that. You know, I had my fun and I had, you know, one surgeon that said, I can fix it and you can run again, really run. And then I had the other train of thought of, you know, yeah, I mean, you probably won't have much better outcome if you don't fix it. And at the end of the day, I said, hey, all I want to do is run with my dogs. I've had my fun. I don't have to go break, you know, six minute miles anymore. I don't have to go do that. I've done it and I'm happy. And so the goal was just to jog with my dogs and, you know, and now I can do that. And I can honestly say that I'm pain free for the first time in a long time with my feet. Uh, so it, yes, the power of journaling, I still write everything down and um, it makes me accountable. And, and, and sometimes, you know, even now add to it what you're grateful for, you know, what what, you know, especially the last 24 hours, there's been a lot going on in the world. It's easy to get caught up in a lot of frustration. And, you know, it still comes down to your little circle, what you're grateful for. Grateful, you know, that you have the, you know, your air to breathe, that you have people around you. Um, you know, we've got so much to be grateful for in our little space. Let's not let too much of the outside world in. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Well, and it's interesting, you know, as I hear you talk, um, and you can see how uh, things are evolving, your injury is evolving. Um, and always, I'm always like, okay, let's get to the root movement cause. And, you know, try and undo as much of um, the imbalances and compensations, because you're right, when you said, our body tries to adapt and compensate. It's incredible. We are masters. Our bodies are masters at this. And I think that very often what people feel when they get that injury, the straw that breaks the camel's back is that, okay, I have to just deal with that one incident. that, okay, it was that one training session I did. But when you can kind of look back and reflect on your year of training and how things have built up over time, uh, it makes a difference. And, mm -hmm. and so I would be encouraging you at your stage in life is, is to get back to the basics and be doing the mobility and movement longevity work as a warm up. And that's what, you know, I've been trying to figure out how do we, how do we help 
people to, you know, do um, to, to preserve their body and to figure out where the imbalances are. And this is one thing I love about the ROM coach, um, you know, where you can do the movement assessment, you can say, oh, you know, I'm really feeling great, but mm -hmm. geez, when I do this part of the movement assessment and I find that my hip is a bit weak on, on the same side that my, maybe my foot's injured. Oh, geez, maybe now I can actually work on the part of my body that isn't hurting. And by fixing that part of my body, I can take the pressure off the sore foot. And mm -hmm. then that will allow the tendon to remodel and heal. And I can avoid further deterioration and get back to doing all the things that I love to do. So it's um, one thing and I, I love, and I know you've done this over your career, is when you are injured and you can't maybe do something with your elbow or with your foot, you focus on other parts of your body and look to see, can you restore your foundation for movement uh, by doing core work, by doing hip work, by doing shoulder blade work. And have you tried, you, you've tried the ROM coach, haven't you? I have. Yeah, no, it's amazing. I, I did the assessment. And uh, actually, it's, uh, after you told me the example of a friend of yours, that's like 20 years older movement age, than they really <laughs> were, I didn't feel so bad. But yeah, my movement age is a couple years older than I am. So that's not terrible. Uh, no, but not I've, been, I've been still I'm, I'm doing the, um, the daily movement tune up. Okay, and, awesome. uh, Thank you. and I, I am enjoying that. And it's interesting. Yeah, it's pretty interesting to do. It's something I, my, my dog Hadley loves to go into, I call it the playroom and uh, it's where all my exercise stuff is. So she just thinks we're going in there to play. Meanwhile, I'm actually doing my, my ROM coach. Uh, and, and I know my area, you know, I've learned again through the expertise of people like yourself around me, you know, my areas of weakness for sure are my feet. I have to, can, you know, yeah, there's that tendon that's working the arch, but there's a whole lot of other structures in the foot that can help with that work. So yeah, I've lost two of them. My big toe doesn't bend and my arch has a tear, or the, the tendon has a tear, but I've got 13 other structures in my foot. So I've got to work those structures. So I work on my feet, uh, my hips, and I work on my back. Um, my hips I work on mainly because my dad had four hip replacements. So it's, it's in the family. Right. And so I want to keep my hips strong. I also had a torn labrum, which never needed surgery. Uh, mm -hmm. We were able to divert surgery by strengthening my core. So I continue to work on my core and try to work on my hips. And then um, my spine, I mean, I've had an MRI of my spine. I know that there's some disc degeneration. It just has to be after sitting on a bike for 20 years. Uh, so working on, on my spine. Uh, so I, I'm doing the wrong coach and going through the library. And uh, yeah, there's no question. It's not... Um, you know, you don't get out of bed going, gee, I can't wait to do those stretches. Like, that's just not, that's just <laughs> not something that we do. But I mean, it takes like weeks to form a habit. Yes. And that's all we have to do is form that habit. And in uh, and, and two little quotes that I, I have heard, and I'm not going to say it exactly, but Jerry Seinfeld said it. Uh, he said, pain creates a hole that knowledge fills. Pain creates a hole that knowledge fills. So in the middle of the night, when you get up and you stub your toe on the corner of your bed and you go, ow, you learn quickly to not do that again. And unfortunately, we often need pain to get the knowledge. So that's sort of one thing that I think about sometimes that we, we require that. And then the fact that most of us require loss to happen before we do anything about it. So if, if I said, hey, you owe me a dollar every time you don't do your flexibility and mobility work, you're going to do it. <laughs> if I said, I'll give you a dollar every time you do it, you don't care. You don't care about gaining those dollars, but you sure as heck don't want to lose those dollars. And so when you're struggling, you know, so I'm sort of saying that to myself now when I'm like, oh my gosh, the last thing I want to do is, is stretching or, you know, doing them. Um, some of the flexibility work, lazy push-ups, whatever for my back, I think to myself, first of all, what's the payback in 10 years when you can't move properly? You know, the, so it's that pain that may happen. And then just if you had to pay, like, are you willing to pay five bucks to Dr. Aaron because you didn't do it today? No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, darn. So we, yeah. <laughs> so we don't want to have that loss either. So yeah, I think it's, um, let's, you know, let's try to create those habits now. And that will, 
you know, hopefully alleviate a lot of the pain later. Well, I think you're right there. And, and um, I'm really very interested in the whole technique of journaling because I believe that um, our, our, our thoughts and our beliefs will dictate our behavior. Mm -hmm. And if you can journal and start looking at how you are behaving and acting today with regards to your body and your injury, and then how you may want to see yourself and then start changing the story of your injury. Um, and um, you've, you, you do this with your, the people that you coach as far as mm -hmm. like picking character traits that mm -hmm. uh, they are proud of uh, when they're performing or when they're under stress. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it would be really helpful for people to write down a character trait that they would be proud of when they're injured um, the resilience, um, problem patience. solving, <laughs> patience. patience, exactly. Patience. Patience. Yeah. Um, yeah. creativity, you know, finding yeah. something else to do, giving yourself permission to actually use that time that maybe you're away from your sport to develop another skill, develop another part of your body, um, reach out and spend time with people that maybe you haven't been able to do because you've been too busy with all of your other things. So there are, there are positives that we can pull out of the negatives. And I think that's where your brilliance is that you are mm -hmm. such a positive person. <laughs> like I, I, I love, I love actually in the email that you sent to me, I remember you said, I, Aaron, I fell intelligently. <laughs> now I, I have a question about that because I'm actually, the team had asked me to do a session next week on cycling injuries. And oh. so can you really fall intelligently? Do you, when you're training, do you learn how to fall off your bike so that you don't break your neck? Well, you know, you definitely, I mean, unless you want a collarbone injury, you don't want to fall with your hand out. You know, I've seen lots out, of them. Yeah, I, yeah, you would. Hand I've out tried. is collarbone. And I think fighting it is, is the hard part. Uh, and I remember when I fell in September, I'm like, I'm going down. There's no question I am falling down. So I better mm -hmm. fall um, taking as much meat. Like I'd like to take it. I'd like to take it here. Uh -huh. But I, 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 I don't really, I think I've took it all here, which I thought would yeah. be fatty enough to be honest, but it really, I guess it wasn't. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I, it happens, it happens quickly and yet slowly but um, I don't ultimately, I don't want to fall. But I think the thing that's interesting now in, in hindsight is I'm not afraid to ride my bike outside, or I'm at least telling myself, you've ridden a bike for 30 years. This was a mechanical issue. It's not you. But I also think I don't want to have to take a break from life again. You know, you kind of start weighing the two sides of it. And um, you know, I don't have to ride my bike outside. I mean, sometimes with athletes that I coach, yes, I need to go out. So there is, if I had an athlete coming down for a training camp next week, I would get myself out on my bike just so I can get over the, the first couple of jitters, no question. But um, in general, the roads are very busy. <laughs> People are on yep. their phones. There's a lot to lose. And I'm at, you know, I'm also at the stage of my life where I like my life and I don't want to lose that. And you know, had I not been able to walk my dogs for six weeks while I had a broken arm, I would have been, that would have been probably the worst thing for me. So there's the hierarchy of priorities. Um, I think the hardest thing was rolling a pizza dough. So my husband wasn't happy, <laughs> but I really struggled to roll in a pizza dough. <laughs> that was the impact on my marriage. <laughs> and there was very little impact on my dogs, but um, you know, I'll, when an athlete gets injured, uh, I often say it's very difficult to rest from an injury. That is the hard part. The easy thing is to run through it or bike through it or swim, you know, whatever. The, usually it's a running injury. I said, it is super simple to go out and run with that torn tendon. It's super simple. It's not, not pain less, but it's easy. The hard thing is to sit down. The hard thing is to creatively force yourself to find something else to do. And, um, you know, I had Achilles surgery, uh, geez, I don't know how, five or six years ago. And I was expecting the worst. I was expecting, you know, a cast and no walking for eight weeks, like actually no walking. 
but it was a, a very easy, much easier surgery. And I was able to walk with crutches um, within the first few days. Uh, but I remember looking on the internet for upper body exercises. And I was just so proud of myself for doing like, like honestly, the most mundane little things, but it was just that I had accomplished something. And I think we all need to accomplish something every day. And for people, let's say you're a runner with an injury and you can't run, you feel like you haven't accomplished anything. So you keep running and you keep the injury going, but we just need to find something else to accomplish. And so it's good to seek out people who have had similar injuries. I mean, again, the internet is an incredible place. You can, you can find celebrity or sports star who had radial head fracture or Achilles tendon surgery and see how they came back. And that can inspire you that yes, like in this little minute frame of time, this is enormous, but two months down the road, you're, you're working. So we, we, we bite off day by day and day by day, things change very, very rapidly when you're doing good things. And, you know, I remember you telling me, um, you know, when I was trying to heal from uh, the Achilles injury before it turned surgical was, you know, picture yourself healing, picture the tendon, you know, you know, knitting back together again, picture yourself doing all these things. And the mental is just as important. You know, when we, when we reach out to a physiotherapist or to a sports doctor or a chiropractor, you're not just reaching out for their knowledge and expertise, but and also for the reassurance and also for the mental health part of it too. I, I think that you're doing yourself a disservice if you haven't found somebody that not only can, can share with you the road to recovery physically, but also a little bit of the road to recovery mentally that's going to help you get there because the mental is just as important. So I really like people to, you know, list, hey, wh where am I being strong today? Like, what am I doing that's strong? Yeah, I can't run, but what else have I done today? Well, you know, I swam four lengths of the pool. I've never swam before. Brilliant. You know, uh, something else that you did, or I really wanted to run and I didn't, or I really wanted to walk. Maybe walking isn't even good for you right now. So I resisted the urge to walk or I resisted um, the urge to walk barefoot in the house, which wouldn't be good either for an Achilles injury. So really list those things that you're proud of. It's so easy to get go fall down in the vortex and say, oh, I'm so defeated. But when we sit down and we actually write down the list of things we have going for us, we can show ourselves that we are far more incredible than we could ever imagine. Well, I, I, and I think you're, you're very correct there that the writing is also so important that, you know, a lot of times I, I've thought, oh, I think this, I thought it, you know, and, or even the visualization, it's one thing to visualize, but there's something about the connection between the pen and the paper and your brain that mm -hmm. I think you bring a lot more senses in. So you have to feel it, you have to see it, you're actually physically writing it. It's different than typing on the computer it's, it's bringing, and you can even speak it at the same time. So you're bringing mm -hmm. all of these senses, um, which connect to your body in a very, very strong way. The mind is kind of, you know, out there and it, it, it provides eventually the motivation and the, 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 the spark plug to actually for action. But, um, you don't want a lot of reaction. <laughs> it's like the emotional yeah. reaction that is negative anyways, is, is detrimental. So the writing and journaling and turning it into positive, like read, you can read it, it can be negative. Like it's okay if it's negative, but get it out. Yeah. Um, there, was a, there was a physician, uh, John, Dr. John Sarna uh, in New York, who was really into back pain. And he actually believed that all back pain was totally emotional, that it was repressed emotions that were in your body that, that um, led to pain. And I think that's a little extreme. I do believe that there are real physical reasons that people have back pain, but I do also believe very firmly that the emotions and our beliefs are um, very strong in determining how we recover. And intuitively as a physician, I've always looked when I'm talking to my patient, uh, what is it they really believe in? Because if you can capture what it is you believe in and use that to your advantage, your belief is what's going to heal you. Your belief mm -hmm. will allow you to heal. So 
if your beliefs are all negative, that's a problem. And, but then if you write it down and you read it out to yourself and it's only for your ears, nobody else has to hear it, make it as truthful as you possibly can, but then you can change those beliefs and, and you can change them over time. And there's a lot of um, evidence in the performance world. Um, and you know this yourself, you know, you're journaling and you're, and you would tell yourself, uh, I'm the world champion. And you had that written everywhere, you know, you, you, every, every time you turned around, I'm world champion, I'm world champion. I'm, so it became you. So if you can have a belief of, I can heal, I can recover, I am resilient, I can deal with the pain, um, I am strong. Uh, you know, you, 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 you tell yourself these things and you write them down then I think that it, it helps a lot with your ability to recover from an injury and, and it helps in the moment. Absolutely. And my, when I was racing, my password, which doesn't suffice anymore because now you need characters and numbers. You don't even have to put it in anymore. But you, in the old days, you used to have to type in your <laughs> password for everything. And, and my password was win Kona. Kona is the world championships. And I did it every single day. And, uh, and, and typed it over and over because I thought if I can see it, I can do it. And, uh, and we have to, you know, I, whatever we want to do, we, we, need, a, we need to have that vision there. And, and, that, and we will get there. We will get there. And it might, it might have to change as time goes on. It might look a little bit different, but we need, to, we need to get there. And it's interesting because, you know, a close friend of mine was worried about something uh, some, you know, something happening in their body. And it's like, what is this? And it's like, okay, let's deal with what we know already. Okay. <laughs> so instead of thinking, is this cancer? Is this, this, is this that? What do we got to work with? Well, you know, we know that you have high blood pressure. So we got to work on that. We know that let's work on that. <laughs> and right. we know that you could exercise more. So let's work on that. And if you do those things and there's something else wrong, at least you're ahead of the game. Because it's all over body management that's going to, at the end of the day, uh, affect how we heal and how we act and how we move. And um, so, you know, let's, instead of worrying and, and, and worry about all these things, let's control what we can control, do the best we can with what yes. we've got and, um, and maximize our, our strengths and minimize our weaknesses. We've all got weaknesses. I, I've got tons of them. <laughs> I'm trying to minimize. Oh, oh my God. Me too. Me too. <laughs> Hey, um, on that note, Yus, do we have anybody in the chat that's at, has anybody got any questions that they maybe want to ask Lisa or, or myself? Uh, yeah, we've got a few questions actually that came in and some comments as well. And uh, okay. hi, Lisa. It's nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet hi. you. Um, okay, so I'll just go through them and you guys can, uh, can answer away. Uh, the first one is from Rachel. Uh, she actually just mentioned she couldn't stay for the whole show, but she's uh, really, really thankful that you guys put this on. Um, and she's actually reading Lisa's book right now. So oh, just fantastic. a quick little comment there. <laughs> um, next up is actually from Brad. Uh, I know Brad. I used to work with him uh, <laughs> many years ago in the corporate world. Uh, he mentioned that keeping a diary is an amazing idea. He's been doing it for a long time. And, you know, with COVID right now, he's been standing at his desk all day wearing running shoes. By the end of the day, uh, the outside of his right foot starts to hurt. Any thoughts on stretches he can do to help this out? So uh, I mentioned the Active Office Worker series that we have on YouTube. Excellent. And uh, I mentioned lower limb control, but wasn't sure if you guys had some insight on that question. Well, I think, first of all, you know, so if you stand in one position for too long, um, that that's an issue that one of the key things, um, you know, we've, we've got this whole premise that sitting is the new smoking. Really, it's not moving is the new smoking. You, so standing at your desk all day is almost as harmful as sitting at your desk all day. So change position frequently. Uh, look at your footwear. Um, and um, when you're at home or if nobody can see, I like those five finger toe shoes. They're the craziest looking things ever. But I actually was getting a hammer toe. And I started walking, I would walk my dogs in my five finger toe shoes, which I had a heck of a time getting on, but I finally figured out how to do it. And the hammer toe went away. And, uh, and then really the key for me has been doing Eric's exercises. Um, you know, he's probably uh, use if we could throw up the weird ankle exercises where he shows about metatarsal pressure, 
and how to move the toes and mobilize the feet, I think also is in um, a YouTube live, YouTube live on uh, balance. Um, but the lower limb control would be the way to go. What about you, Lisa? What do you, what do you think? <laughs> I love that. And you put me onto the weird um, ankle exercises because I need that for my little feet. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and just um, like I'm standing right now, but I put on my running shoes, my orthotics and everything, and I'm sort of dancing around a bit. But when I, um, even if you're sitting at your desk, what I tend to do sometimes when I'm sitting at my desk, because I know everyone's all against sitting now, uh, is often I'll kneel at my desk just to stretch my hip flexors out, mm -hmm. uh, activate my glutes a little bit. So, you know, athletes that I coach that uh, have tight hamstrings, which is a lot of them, or back, lower back pain, I'll say, you know, we're all working from home. You kneel at your desk, put a pillow underneath your knee and do one, one leg at a time, alternate between the two legs and just get a little bit slightly forward for your hip flexors. So uh, it's, it's back to the all or nothing thing is it's, we don't have to stand all the time. We don't have to sit all the time. We don't have to do anything all the time. Uh, motion is lotion. We have to just keep, keep moving for sure. Yep, yep. And just the, the uh, active office workers got some great exercises that people can do while they're in their office. So that, that's, that's awesome. So Brad, you got lots of tips there. Great, thanks guys. Uh, next up is Jamie. Does the concept that doing the right thing helps right away apply to most musculoskeletal pain situations? One of the biggest challenges in chronic pain injuries, figuring out what's working. So more of a calm, I guess it's a question. Yeah, maybe you can address that. Um, so if you've had chronic pain, say chronic, chronic back pain for years and years and years, um, it's a little trickier to just have that one magic bullet exercise to, um, make the quick fix, but there's no question in my mind, if you get the right muscles turned on and activated, you will feel better right away. Um, then it becomes a matter of building your foundation. So if you're feeling better right away because you have the right muscles turned on, but then you go and you try to run a marathon, you're probably going to get sore again. So you have to go through the steps of not only building the foundation for movement, but then building your pyramid by building endurance, strength, power, and speed, depending on where you want to go. So it's a little bit more complicated with the chronic injury, but definitely fixable if you get the right path. Great. Okay. Um, next up is from Aiden. Hey, Dr. B, I have non-displaced tears in my hips and have a CAM FAI. I'm currently doing the TFL and spine control programs, experiencing a lot of pain doing the banded distraction stretches. I was told it was possible to flip the tear. Is that even possible? Also, at what point would you recommend someone go under the knife? I've been working on TFL and um, spine control for two months and still in a lot of pain. Okay, so uh, to address your first question um, about flipping the tear, uh, I would have to see your MRI to kind of see what how big the tear is. Occasionally they can flip, but you will get very mechanical symptoms where you make one specific move, you'll feel uh, a sharp pain, and it'll be like your hip is locked, uh, which is different from a lot of impingement pain, which is more at the front of the hip and it's at the maximum flexion. So there's, um, when, you, when you, if you're flipping a fragment um, of the, of the uh, labrum, it, it can occur, um, but it's quite rare. And eventually what would happen is if you had kept ignoring it is you would do your own, uh, you would do, you, you would wear that, that fragment off. Um, I don't really recommend that. Um, if doing when you're doing the um, hip scouring and you're mobilizing your hip and you do a lot of that, and then you don't turn the muscles on immediately after you can irritate your hip. So what I would suggest you do is you stop. Um, maybe, maybe not, don't stop doing the hip scouring, but maybe don't do it quite as intensely. So mobilize the hip, then do the activation routine for the TFL program and see if that makes a difference in your irritability. Um, I would lead, need a little bit more information um, with regards to you know, your x-ray results and um, the MRI findings uh, and your physical examination to tell you whether or not surgery is, um, when, when surgery would, would be necessary, but 
Lisa, you had a you had a uh, a labral tear in your hip and were able to manage non surgically. How long did it take you to get uh, get through it? Uh, it took about two months, mm -hmm. and uh, so it started in uh, yeah late uh, late August, and my surgical appointment was November the fourth. I remember it clearly, and I went to the surgeon and. She said, well, if you're not in pain, not in pain now, but I was in excruciating pain. It just felt like a knife was lodged in my hip. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't run for the whole, that whole two months. And, you know, again, the, the theory was let's work on what we can. So we're going to work on everything around uh, your, you know, the hips not tracking right. It, with actually the thought, I went to the Hawaii Ironman that year to try to race. Mm -hmm. And um, because the idea was if I can just kind of move that hip joint so that I'm not nicking the tear every single time, then I might be a business. Um, <clears throat> so we, uh, we, you know, really worked hard on, on core strength and, and that's um, in the obliques in particular. And this was something I always did, but we really focused on it. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, just stretching, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then when I, you know, before the appointment, uh, I went for a 30 minute run and I was pain free. So it was, nice. um, you know, that the surgeon said, there's no way we will touch this. Uh, you know, perhaps back then surgery wasn't as advanced, but uh, so that's why they wouldn't even touch it. But she said, if you're in, you know, if this comes back, then we'll look at it, but it, it really hasn't. And so whenever I get any sort of thing happening around my hips or my glutes, I'm, I'm always pretty cautious and, <clears throat> you know, knock on wood, nothing's happened yet um, regarding that. So that's awesome. And it's, it, I think that with hip, uh, labral tears were very much uh, where we were 30 years ago with knee meniscus, knee meniscus tears. And now we're realizing that doing surgery on them isn't really the greatest thing. If you're having true mechanical symptoms where it's locking and catching, yes, you may need an operation. But um, I would suggest that um, um, maybe um, getting the hip pocket, reviewing the hip pocket, um, was, it, was it Cam? Was it Cam? Sorry, Yus, what was our call our chat person's yep. name cam it was cam. uh it was iden iden sorry iden um iden i would suggest that you review the um hip posterior hip pocket um ask dr b session where i talk about really being able to get that femoral head posteriorly located into the back of the into the back of the joint and really get the joint centrated and um and if that doesn't work then reach out to us and we'll see what we can figure out Great. Um, next up is from Diane, and it's going to be a bit of a tongue twister for me. I'm not used to saying all the medical <laughs> terms, but I'm going to try my best. So uh, tibia plateau fracture coupled with four metatarsal fracture and probable posterior tibialis tendon tear. There, Whoa. I got it out. <laughs> wow. Okay, A plus for my that My foot. One. That's my foot. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so, my question. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Diane is saying, uh, she's currently doing the lower limb. She's, uh, went through phase one and it was okay, but phase two was a little bit more challenging. She wanted some suggestions and she added some comments as well here. Uh, your programs are amazing. Blew the physiotherapist away when she saw how far her leg had come along doing, uh, the lower, the lower limb control phase one. Um, and then Wonderful. there was some discussion in the, in the chat area, just about staying positive. So it's multiple things here. How about you address the, the initial question and I'll, I'll let you know about the, the positivity aspect as well. Okay. Sorry. I wasn't quite sure what, I, I wasn't quite sure where she was stuck now. Like she's, so in, she's saying she's that trying to get into the next phase, but she's having yes. a problem, but what's the problem? Like, so, is it the, the knee or the foot? Okay. So maybe, uh, Dan, if you're watching, if you can just post that in the chat, um, she, she said that phase one was okay, but phase two was too challenging. So I would guess just from, from the history of having two fractures, that it's a tissue pliability issue. Meaning um, that if you, if you look at your, the capsule and the tendons and the muscles, the connective tissues in your body, normally they're going to move kind of like this fabric. So that it's, if it's a little, a little bit um, stiff and you get the muscle and you, you can pull the tissue with the muscle, but if you've had an injury, the tissue becomes more like, say, leather, where it's stiff. And there's a little bit of give if you pull on it, but it's much harder to get the length and the range of motion when you get your muscles activated. 
and that it's most likely that you just need a little bit more time in the initial phases because as your muscles pull on this tissue, the leather will become more like uh, your usual fabric. So spend some more time in phase one, building the number of reps you're doing and really consolidating those uh, movements before you move into phase two. Great. Um, so one of the things that's come up is just about staying positive when you have chronic pain or when you have, you know, the extended amount of time where you're, you're in pain. Um, I know that Diane also responded to uh, someone in, in here and just said that uh, hers has been going since June and she's had some dark days, but the trick she learned was accepting where she was and being grateful for the opportunity to find a solution. So I know that uh, I, I did mention that you've addressed dealing with chronic pain in previous episodes, mm -hmm. but maybe just a comment about, you know, because some people say it's, it's very hard to stay positive when you're experiencing mm -hmm. chronic pain. So how do you guys deal with that? Maybe some feedback there. Lisa, why don't you go ahead? Cause you, you know, you, you, <laughs> yeah, you, it's you, hard. There's no question. It's, it's super hard. And, you know, it can just take a little niggle to put you in a bit of a bad mood. And I say bad mood with, with total love and affection because we've all been there where you could be having the greatest day and then all of a sudden something flares up and you know, oh, this is, this is not a one day injury. This is part of my chronic cycle. And now you're not happy anymore. So I, I suppose what I sometimes would say to myself and, I, and I, I've, been, I've been there for sure is I, I, I really do ask myself, who do I want to be? Like, you know, I, I look at the pain and I think, did I do something silly? Did I do something wrong? Uh, or is this just the way that it is? And how am I going to be my best self in spite of this pain? And I, I, I sort of, you know, try to go through, I mean, it doesn't mean I don't go back down the vortex. Like I can do my three gratitudes and I'll still go, I'm grateful for X, Y, Z, man, my foot hurts, you know, like, I mean, it's not, <laughs> it's not all, 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 all sunshine, but um, you know, definitely if you do it, it's not going to be a light switch. You're not going to go from being really sad about your chronic pain to feeling and accepting it. But, um, you know, I go back to that quote, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can change, and, and, and the wisdom to know the difference. I can't change the dogs barking. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm going to go hide over here. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, some things I can't change, so I have to accept. But I mean, I think for me, I, I definitely try to problem solve as much as I can what's going on. So as someone who's had a ton of foot problems, I probably have 10 pairs of orthotics. <laughs> I, um, some people invest in the stock exchange. I invest in orthotics. And, you know, there might be one that works for a few months and then something develops and I have to switch to another pair of orthotics. So I'm constantly problem solving and constantly trying to figure out what works. You might have one pair of shoes that works and, and then all of a sudden it doesn't. So having multiple options, like know where your weakness is and then have strategies, develop strategies to deal with it the best that you can. So um, as someone, you know, as you said, you have foot problems. So I'd have a lot of different shoes. Some days you might need a wider shoe. Some days you might need a heel lift. Um, some days you might need, uh, something with a wider toe box, you know, whatever it happens to be having different orthotics, having tape. So sometimes you might have to tape some toes together. So these are the things that I go through. Uh, and then, you know, when it feels really difficult, I'll do an activity, which actually doesn't cause me pain. And, you know, it's incredible what we can do when, uh, we find something that works. So, you know, when I had that labral tear and I couldn't run, that's two months. I'm a professional athlete. I'm going to race the world championships. And I'm believing that I, you know, I had a goal. I believe that I could do it. I was water running, which means running in the deep end without touching the ground. So there's no impact. I was water running for two to three hours at a time. And so many people would say, how could you do that? That's so boring. I said, I was so happy because it was something I could do. It was something that I could control. So find that something that you can do that will give you some empowerment to deal with it a little bit better. That's going to give you those endorphins. That's going to be like, you know, when I was water running, I was not in any pain at all. It was like nothing was, was wrong. 
Um, you know, again, a few years ago, I was had to go on intravenous because I've cystic fibrosis. And uh, I, you know, my lung function was terrible. I was not very well. The nurse would come to my house every day to change my, you know, help with my pick line and do the intravenous. And she came once and I was riding my bike, my stationary bike, and she was in shock. And I said, I said, for one hour a day, I don't feel like I have cystic fibrosis. And, you know, my, I don't look at what power I'm pushing. I don't look at any of those things, but for one hour a day, I feel like a normal human being. And we all, like, if you're in chronic pain, you need one hour a day when you're not in chronic pain, find out what activity that is. Hopefully it can deliver you some endorphins and, and, and thrive on that and make that your goal and then make it an hour and a half a day and two hours a day. So I, I hope that helps. I know it sounds super fluffy. It's not easy. And I sympathize with you. Um, but again, make that list of things you've got going for you. Cause I'm sure in spite of that chronic pain, you have so much going for you and write it down, get that journal going. Yeah, Lisa, Lisa, that's amazing, amazing advice. And, you know, even at the very beginning, if, um, you know, you can't do one hour in a row, five minutes every hour, or one minute every hour and build upon exactly. it. And, and the writing down your positive character, character traits and who you want to be, despite the fact that you're in pain, what makes you what would make you feel good is very powerful. So I encourage I encourage you to do that. Okay, um, we'll go through maybe one or two more. Okay, yeah, we're good. Yeah. Um, I think are we've had okay? some. Are you okay, Lisa, for time for another I'm, few minutes? I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, we've just had some comments. You know, it's, it's inspiring to meet people um, with the same injuries. So that's come up. And I think that's a very, very nice point uh, to bring up. So there was some feedback there. Um, Thank you. This has given me hope and inspiration for my shoulder. I will work on setting up a daily routine for strength and ROM in the surrounding area. Awesome. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about just the ROM app uh, for a second there, Dr. B, just about, you know, having that, setting something up in ROM and using it to address pretty much your entire body. Well, the one thing I'm thrilled about ROM um, use is that uh, and Lisa, is that um, you may be hearing about, oh, you get an imbalance in your body or you, you, know, you have a little ache or a little pain, but you're not really sure where to start. Maybe you don't have that team of uh, you know, a personal trainer or a physiotherapist who really um, is available to you. So the ROM coach can give you an idea of where your um, difficulties are, where your lack of mobility is, where you maybe need to do a little bit of work. So you can do the movement assessment um, and that will um, highlight a part of your body that needs to be addressed. And you'll be prescribed four or five exercises that you can schedule into your routine. And um, I mean, me personally, I had a number of areas like, uh, and, and it's, I, I think one of the, don't get depressed if you get on there and your movement age is like, you know, a hundred years older than you really are. Like I've, I've heard people say that they're really kind of down in the dumps because gosh, they don't want to be older than, than they are. But I had one of my friends, she's an eMERGE physician uh, in Wisconsin and she's working like a dog. And with the way that she um, gets some of her stress out is she goes on a group Peloton ride every day. So she's like incredibly fit with uh, her cardiovascular system, but she feels stiff. Like she, so she's, um, she's 30. 32. So she goes, she, she can't get out of bed in the morning. She, oh. She's really stiff. So I said, try this ROM coach. And she did it. She texted me. She goes, Oh my God, I'm like 10, 15 years older than I should be. And I said, I said, beautiful. This is beautiful. This is exactly what you need because you can schedule in five um, or 15 minutes a day before you get on the Peloton bike or before, you know, try to try to tag it with something like something that you do every day, whether it's walk the dog, you know, you're going to do it just before you walk the dog and you're going to address an imbalance and you're going to improve your mobility so that when you're 50, you're riding your Peloton faster than you are now that when you're 80, you're not having a hip replacement and you can enjoy the quality of your life. So it's not really a program to 
heal a significant injury, but it's a great program to point out where your imbalances are and give you something to do. Uh, and even doing it once a week, like I, I thought, oh, geez, let me, I'm going to just try this neck restoration once a week. Um, and I couldn't believe the difference between the first and the second time. And then the third time in particular that I went through that specific program, how much better I was. So it, it, I think it's a fantastic tool. And then the other thing on the, on the ROM coach is the daily movement tune up, which um, is the concept of making movement part of your daily life, just like you would brush your teeth. So spend three to five minutes on your body. Uh, you, can, you, you can tap on three areas that, of your body that you might be interested in. For me, it was uh, my neck, my elbow and my knee. And then I'm given a random three exercises every day. And over a two week period, I hit all of these parts of my body. Uh, and uh, it's helped me maintain good mobility and, uh, and strength. So I really hope we can get people into this habit and joining us um, to, to keep moving. Because for me, life is motion. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it, I remember this 90 year old patient I had, he was, he came in and he was an ultra marathoner, Lisa, ultra marathoner, and he loved running. I said, Hey, how you doing? He goes, well, doc, I figure if it doesn't hurt, it's dead. <laughs> so this really, you know, often if, if you're in pain, at least, you know, it's alive. And, <laughs> and um, anyways, I, I, I think it's a great tool for keeping us moving and, and, and doing the things we love to do. Yeah, I agree. I'm just going to second it because I, I mean, you guys put me onto it. And uh, I, I remember my, you know, I've had the same physiotherapist for um, 24 years, 25 years. And when I retired from sport and, you know, I'd go in and he'd like push on my leg and he's like, come on, Lisa, like, this isn't good. And, and I'm like, oh, I got to get strong. And he's like, as you age, it's not so much. Yeah, you need your strength, of course, no question. But he said, it's flexibility and mobility that's going to set you back. If you're not flexible, mobility, uh, mobile enough, the strength can't do its job. And he said, so we, you know, you've got to dedicate your time to flexibility and mobility. But the challenge is, is if I'm not going to physio, I'm not necessarily addressing that. And so the, the nice thing about ROM coach, especially this year, I mean, I don't know if it happened, if it was timed with COVID, but you know, really, we all have to be so much more um, personally responsible for our health and well being, you can't just run out anytime you want to go to, to see somebody, they, you know, um, physically, whether that be a chiropractor or a massage therapist or a physiotherapist or a doctor. So we have to take personal responsibility. So I mean, the fact I mean, these videos are so amazing. <laughs> it takes mm -hmm. you right through it. And uh, so, you know, I, I personally am really enjoying that. And I'm, and there's athletes that I coach that I'm having them do things on it because, um, I mean, it really makes my job a lot easier. I can't tell you the number of my own YouTube videos that I've created trying to explain a stretch to an athlete and I can't explain it. So I send them a little YouTube video of me attempting the stretch. And let me tell you, I'm, I'm not as good as Eric. And now I'm like, I don't have to pretend to know that stretch. I'm just going to tell them to do this and do this lower leg stuff. <laughs> it's fantastic. So I, it's, it's, it's been good for me. But, um, you know, I just know now <clears throat> I'm over 50 years old and I want to be walking and I want to be active when I'm 60, 70 and 80 years old. And I don't think going for a run or riding my bike or a rowing machine is going to help me do that. It's part of it, but I think it's going to be my mobility that's going to help me. And, and so, you know, I, I think it's pretty exciting. No, thanks for that, Lisa. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you both. It's actually very inspiring uh, to hear both of you share your knowledge and we're getting the same in the, um, uh, in the message area here. I know uh, they're wishing you a happy new year from Donna Oh, and um, thank you, Lisa, for the positive words and advice on how to try to overcome bad days with chronic pain. Really appreciate it. So thank you. That's awesome. Well, yeah, thank um, you well, thank you, Yus, and thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you know, it's 
really what we want to do is, is keep people moving. It's about movement longevity. And uh, I hope that people were able to take away a couple of gems from uh, our star, Lisa. And uh, <laughs> we're, we're, very, we're very grateful that you um, joined in. And for anybody uh, who didn't, wasn't here at the beginning, um, Lisa's book, The Unlikely Champion, is on her website. We've got that in the, um, the blog uh, or a description for the show today. And please, uh, please go and get it. It's, uh, if you're feeling down, it's a great <laughs> book to read. Uh, un unbelievable. So thank you for everything that you do for us, Lisa. And thank my, you. Ple my pleasure, everybody. And if you got an injury, I've probably had it. So you'll survive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I've posted uh, the link to the book actually um, in the comments. So if anybody's looking for it, you can find it there. And I also posted the link to uh, ROM Coach, which is free. Um, so all the links in there. And I posted some of the uh, other programs, lower limb control, spine control, all of that will be posted in for people in case they're wondering. And it's all there. So thank you both. All right. Thank Thanks you. a lot.